What's up, guys? My name is Matt Ramos. And I'm Brad Lambert. And today we're sitting down with the talented director of Loki, Kate Heron. Kate, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Nice to see you both. <laughs> you as well. Kate, first of all, I want to honor you and just thank you so much for crafting this show the way you did. It was an absolute masterpiece. It's my personal favorite Disney Plus show so far. How about you, Brad? Same. I mean, you captivated audiences worldwide. And I don't think a lot of people saw this coming. So that's more credit to you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it was just, you know, I'm very grateful to Kevin Feige and just all the team at Marvel just for giving me the chance. I mean, you see it with a lot of the directors they're hiring, right? That they're coming from like these indie film backgrounds or like for me, like I'd, I'd just done TV. I haven't even made a film. So I was just like, yeah, it was a massive opportunity for me. And I think that was interesting as well across our whole team because, you know, my head's a department we'd all done stuff, but like, you know, Natalie, for example, Autumn, my head, um, like, uh, sorry, director of photography, uh, Kazra, like we'd all done like our jobs and other productions, but like nothing on this scale before. So I think all of us were like, we're just gonna go big or go home. <laughs> it's like, you know, we wanted to show what we could do. So yeah, so thank you so much. Yeah, and we felt that from the first episode and Kate, it's crazy that you say that is, is because when this Loki show was first announced, for me personally, I was questioning, how is Marvel going to make this big blockbuster Disney Plus show centered around a side character in the MCU? So when this show was first announced, what was your initial reaction to it? And have you always been a fan of like the Marvel lore? So what excited you about this, just the announcement of this show? I think for me, like on one hand, there's like the fan side, right? Where I'm like, where has he gone? <laughs> and I want to know. <laughs> answer my questions because I went through a lot in Infinity War and then it was like he's alive wait what was happening so I, I wanted to know that answer under NDA though I guess like when I would have found out um and then the other side is that I just love Loki and like I love the character and I, I think it got like so many of the comic book runs but also like Tom because I like everyone right like the last decade with his character arc it felt so earned seeing him go from this villain to this anti-hero but I think it's because it was such a slow burn doing that and I thought it was so well done and you know Tom's performance it just grounded Loki with like so much empathy but also wit and charisma and I just wanted to be part of it and I and also just from a storyteller perspective I was intrigued because it's Loki from Avengers it's not the Loki we've seen go on this crazy journey so I was like yeah what are they going to do with that Loki so Yes, yeah, so I had multiple reasons, but yeah, I just kind of really heavily sought them out <laughs> to try and get, you know, my hat in the ring. So yeah, here I am. <laughs> well, on that note, I want to talk about your initial pitch meeting. And there's been mm -hmm. a lot of buzz around that where apparently your agent was like, hey, just come in, have a chat with them. It's going to be fine. And you were like, no, I'm going to write the first two episodes. I'm going to arc out the entire show and have a 60 page presentation. So yeah. first, I love that. I love that so much because like, why, why go in halfway? If you I have a chat, I want to wow them. Right. And you came in there with like, boom, you threw your binder on the desk. <laughs> like, this is my show. <laughs> yeah. I'm very intense. I just, I think that I, I just basically remember my agent. Yeah. was like, because basically I had two Skypes with two of the executives and then it was like the big pitch to Feige and the rest of the team. And I remember, yeah, my agents were like, you know, it's a casual conversation. Basically just like, don't make it weird. Yeah. Just be cool, be cool, man. Like almost like a first date or something. And they're like, don't be weird. And like, but I was just like, no, because I'm, I, I, you know, I'm so aware, right? I've done comedy and drama and I know I'm good at character and I've got work to show that. But other than like all my genre stuff is stuff because I'm a writer as well. I didn't write on Loki, but like, I love genre as a writer. And the thing I always found as a writer was that I try and pitch my scripts and they'd be like, oh, it's cool, but like, you can't direct this, like the budget or like, we need a director that can do this stuff. And I was like, but I can, and like, but it never worked. So for me, I was like, okay, well, I know I don't have like the action experience or special effects experience, but I'm going to just talk about how I would approach it. Cause I think there's some directors where I know that if they have like a weak spot, they kind of avoid it. Whereas me, I don't know, maybe it's like, comedy background or something I'm like let's talk about the pain and the problem and I'll be like this is like I don't have this experience but this is what I love about the fighting styles we could do with Sylvie for example and okay. like uh with the time theater I had like a kind of a clip from a minority report because I love the idea I think in the script I know that 
Michael had written it almost like they were watching the film, but I thought it'd be cool to almost make it Minority Report. Sorry, I'm like going off on tangents. I was excited by that because there's that scene where he sees his wife and obviously she's passed on, but she's like this real life uh, kind of like hologram that he can almost touch. And I thought that was so painful. And I love the idea of taking that as inspiration for the time theater. Cause I, I like the idea of him almost seeing like a play of his life on stage. And I thought that the same feeling, right? He was going to see Frigga. He was going to see people from his life that are now in a time that he cannot reach. So I think for me, that felt like good drama and that we could film it in the room. So that was kind of part of the pitch. But also on top of that, just with the initial pitch, I remember just thinking, well, I just have to prove myself because I don't know. I didn't know there were going to be like two Zoom meetings and then the pitch to Feige. For all I knew, I was only ever going to speak to Kevin Wright and Stephen Broussard, the two Marvel executives. So I was like, I've got to wow these guys because I'm fully aware the other directors they're meeting probably had the experience I don't have. So I wanted to come in with a really clear visual interpretation of the script and also just how I would do it basically beyond all the character stuff I knew I could do. So yes, I, I, I really went for it basically. <laughs> hey, go big or go home. I love it. Yeah. Hey, you completely owned it. And you know, Brad and I had the chance of watching the first two episodes early. And one of the things Brad and I were talking about was how you completely reinvented the character of Loki from the beginning. I mean, you mentioned the, the time theater scene and, and how that entire sequence played out. And it was just crazy to watch because up to this point, we know Loki's story. We know it from the beginning to the end. And now this is a variant of Loki that's watching his life play out. And you completely reinvented this character in a way where now he has so much more story to be told for the future for the future of the MCU. So for mm -hmm. you, what intrigued you most about reinventing this character in the way you did? I think honestly, I was just so excited by initially like, you know, the writing, right? Because I just thought it was such an interesting idea, like even just the the nature of it, him watching moments from his life and like almost like he became the audience member and felt like we did, right? Watching all these moments in the films. And I thought that was so exciting. And then also the idea, like, I, you know, that he goes to work for the TVA, but then it pivots in episode three and it actually, no, it's going to be this love story between him and a version of himself. And I was like, that's just so intriguing to me. And yeah, I think for me, I always felt like, well, if we're going to do a show about Loki, there's got to be a good reason to go back in. And also, you know, it's a different Loki. So is he going to be an anti-hero by the end or not? And I think that kind of you know, are we truly good or are we truly bad really echoed across the whole show and all our characters in the show. So I think for me, that was exciting in terms of the reinvention. And then obviously working with Tom Hiddleston because, you know, he felt the same. He's like, we're going back in. Let's like show some new, he talks about Loki like keys on the piano. And he said, let's show some new keys. So, you know, you have everything from him being tongue tied around Sylvie, which I, you know, he's the God with an answer for everything and he doesn't know how to talk to her but also like singing on the train <laughs> we haven't you know he doesn't get many wins and I felt like well weirdly that was kind of a win for him he had a lovely time and had some figgy ports so I think that was the fun thing with the show was kind of trying to peel back and show new aspects of his identity even just things like you know his magic like we saw a bit of telekinesis in Dark World yeah, but we got yes. to use it a lot more here so I was digging into those aspects as well. For sure. And, you know, before before the show premiered on Disney Plus, I had the pleasure of speaking with Michael Waldron, who mm -hmm. not only wrote this show, but is also writing or also wrote Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. What I love about this show so much and its ending is that not only do we get, you know, some closure on Loki's story, but it ends open ended. Like there's no telling where they're going to go with season two with Spider-Man No Way Home, with Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. So when preparing this show for its release, mm -hmm. it, were there any decisions made to assist in setting up the storylines for Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness or maybe even Spider-Man No Way Home? To be honest, like that, the secrecy at Marvel is very real. <laughs> so like, so basically I know nothing about Doctor Strange and Spider-Man, I wish I did, but I just don't. And basically <laughs> you always have like a Marvel executive working with you across the show who was Kevin Wright on our show and Stephen Brassard. And yeah. basically they kind of, you know, it's like Michael's in a unique situation because basically, but then he basically, he was with us and then he left to go do Doctor Strange. So I guess he was kind of taking the knowledge of what we did to mm. that, go work on that. But generally, obviously like me and Michael, when we were working together, we were focused on this ship. Whereas your Marvel executive is, they know all the other ones, you know what I mean? So like they kind of would steer us 
but we wouldn't necessarily know what ripple effect it's having on the other things because yeah it's very secretive yeah. so it's like a need to know basis kind of thing but yeah well hey <laughs> on that note it's been said you were involved in the casting for jonathan majors for ant-man mm -hmm. and the lost quantum mania so as kang the conqueror so <laughs> I want to ask you, what about his performance and his audition made you stand back and say, oh, he's our guy? Yeah, so he's he's an amazing actor. But like, I think one thing I'd say is he didn't actually audition. So we oh, basically, yeah. so it was like the studio, oh. me, Peyton. And basically we were all taught. And like I said, I don't know what he's doing in, in Peyton's film, but I knew what I needed for our project. And basically we were all talking about actors we were excited about. I couldn't believe I was even part of the discussion just because, you know, Marvel could have easily just made this by themselves because sure. it's a huge role for so many projects of theirs. But I think that shows how collaborative they are as a studio that, you know, we had a seat there. But anyway, but Jonathan was an actor that we were all really excited about working with. And for me, I was like, well, he's an amazing character actor. And so that made me really excited just to see his interpretation of, you know, are he who remains variant. So yeah and Peyton was excited so yeah that's kind of how that came to pass is that you know and then we all called him and I had a call with him and Peyton had a call with him and we spoke to him about our different projects and he was like I would you know love to do it so I think something as well with Jonathan is once I knew we had him I didn't have anyone yet cast to do the voice of the timekeepers but Wizard of Oz obviously is a massive reference for us yep. yes. and so it felt like well, we have to get the wizard to do the voices. And also Jonathan's an amazing character actor, so he can do all these voices. So I remember we did mocap with him, obviously, which the visual effects artists used to animate them. But we sent him all this art, obviously concept art of the timekeepers. And so he basically would look at the faces and he can, he'd send me and Kevin Wright, my set producer, like these really crazy, like amazing audio notes with it. like different voices he could do. So, yeah, I mean, I think it was it was incredible to work with him. So, you know, on that note of Jonathan Majors, as mm -hmm. he who remains, there have been a lot of theories and interpretations about how that ended with him. My interpretation is I felt like he was manipulating Loki and Sylvie to a very specific result, which ended in his death. But mm -hmm. others are like, no, they had a choice. But to me, it really felt like it was an illusion of choice. Mm -hmm. and he, was, he was pressing the buttons, he was, you know, stirring <laughs> the pot, and he was putting them up against each other. So I want to ask you, was that an actual choice? Or was he manipulating and giving the illusion of control, when in reality, it was going to end the way he wanted it to end? I believe because, you know, in theory, right, he could have probably worked out all the different scenarios of which it could be. Mm -hmm. But I really believe him when he looks excited and he's like, I'm being candid, like, I don't know what's going to happen. Because I think for him, that's the thrill, right? Like, yeah. someone that always knows what's going to happen. Why not? Why not just, I think there's something really chaotic in that, which is really exciting. So in my head, no, I think he kind of, he gives both parties enough ammunition for their fight, um, but who will win? He doesn't know. He doesn't know which you know version is going to go. So, no. In my head, I always thought that he was being truthful in that moment. I love that. And Kate, after this show ended, fans did what fans do, and they continue to dive deeper into the ending and what all of these little references could mean. And it turns out that if you line up the final episode of WandaVision with the final episode of Loki. <laughs> When He Who Remains reaches the threshold, Wanda is simultaneously becoming the Scarlet Witch. So is this just a coincidence or did Wanda's transformation into the Scarlet Witch cause He Who Remains to reach the threshold? Ah, interesting. I would say, I mean, it was definitely coincidental on our side. <laughs> like, I mean, we were, both, I, we were filming, we hadn't filmed episode six we were in post basically when WandaVision went on television. So mm -hmm. I think it probably is coincidental <laughs> would be my oh. thing, but I wouldn't want to shut down any theories though. It's kind of fun. So yeah. Hey, it's it's fun. Yeah. It's open-ended. And that's the beautiful thing with Marvel yeah. is that they're always planting these seeds and sometimes they blossom, sometimes they don't. So we're going to have to wait and see for the future projects if this <laughs> does blossom. But Kate, fans are obviously extremely excited for the future of Jonathan Majors in the MCU. His other variants are on the way. What can you tell the fans of what we can expect from his other variants that seem to be coming in the future MCU projects? I honestly can't. I, I All I know is about he who remains. So I would say it would be he a question remains. for Kevin Feige. <laughs> we'll be able to start with Peyton maybe, but yeah, but I don't know. I'm sort of as in the dark as everyone else. 
Yeah, I mean, we're we're all extremely excited to see more of Jonathan Majors. I mean, just from his performance alone, I mean, people fell in love with him. And that's that we we're seeing the good variant. Imagine the yeah. other ones that he was warning us about. And and truly that good variant really creeped me out. Yeah. So I can't imagine a full blown <laughs> evil one. So I'm looking forward to that. But you know, I want to take a step back here, Kate, and talk talk mm -hmm. about the underlying tones and storylines in this show. You talked about it, you know, the show talked a lot about free will and, but it also talked about how things you're already destined to be or your future's already determined, right? So I want you to speak on that for someone, for the people out there yeah. who are trying to figure out their, their life, their world, you know, their path, right? I want you to talk about like, what advice would you give to them where they may be labeled oh. as someone or something. You know, I, I love these themes that you have in this show. So from Kate Heron, I want you to say, you know, some advice to, to help someone who's trying to figure themselves out. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I think it's something that we're always, I don't think you ever, I think when I was younger, I always thought I'd like reach an end point, right? And I'd be like, cool, I'm, I'm sorted now. I know who I am and I don't think you ever work that out. I think it's sort of what makes life exciting, right? You're probably always asking that question and working that out. Um, what other things I'd say, like, I don't know, being your authentic self, I guess is very brave uh, yeah. for lots of people. And it is a journey, I think, to work out who you are. Um, I hope the TVA aren't real. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll have control over our destinies. Um, but honestly, yeah, I think just, you know, I, I think there's that thing where it can feel quite lonely, right? If you feel a bit lost in the world, but like hopefully knowing that everyone, I know for myself, definitely, like it's always something. I think so many of us, I mean, I think even just during pandemic, cause you know, we're all inside and we couldn't yeah. go out. We couldn't go out. It, a lot of us were like, who am I? What is my place in the world? What is my destiny? Like, I know lots of people that were reflecting on that. And yeah, so my best thing would be like, yeah, be kind to yourself and yeah, every, you know, you're not alone. Basically. I love that. And, yeah. and on that note, self-love and self-acceptance was another big thread to this storyline. So mm -hmm. what advice would you give to someone who's currently struggling with self-love and self-acceptance? Oh, it's hard. It's hard. Um, therapy is great. Um, <laughs> uh, truthfully, it is great. Um, and just to be honest, similar to what I just said to the other question, really, I mean, it's a very personal thing and yeah and everyone has their own journey and yeah that would be my it's like kind of like a, a half answer because I feel like but it definitely that I think that it, it's hard I think particularly if you're struggling with your identity to like because you it's always that thing of like you don't sometimes you don't even realize until you've kind of arrived and you're even yeah. beyond that point you know so and yeah. we saw that with Sylvie though which is why I love yeah. that we're at the very end she's like but I'm not you yeah. And that was her becoming her true self and following yeah. what she ultimately wanted. So, yeah, I am a variant of Loki, but I'm not you. And I find yeah. that to be really powerful. Yeah, it was really important to me and the team to just, you know, like, there's that interesting thing, right, in episode three, where I think he calls her like a faded photocopy, but it's very yeah. egotistical, which is implying <laughs> that, you know, I am the one true Loki and the rest of you are just kind of, you know, keys on the piano that is obviously me. But, and there's that thing, right, like, I think we're all of us, I suppose, would feel that, you know, we met a version of ourselves, we'd be like, oh, of course, that's a version of me, but it's not like she's, you know, they have the same place on like, I don't know, the board game, uh, chessboard or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like they, they have the same role to play in destiny terms, but they are different beings because, you know, we, see, we even see it in her past, like she grew up in a palace fleetingly yeah. and then she was taken by the TVA and she's grown up in apocalypses. Casuals. And so, yeah, her background is going to be so different to his. Yeah. So, and I think you see it, you know, with our Lokis in the void, they all have a very different story to tell and a very different aspect of what makes a Loki a Loki. So yeah, it was always, and that last line that you spoke about was really important to us because, you know, it's painful on the one hand because I always think of her being where Loki was in Thor, you know, yeah. like she's driven by like revenge and hatred, um, but she can't get out of it. And he can see that because, you know, he's done his like Mobius therapy session and he's been on this big journey. Yeah, yeah. But it's painful if someone you love is somewhere in a bad place and you want to help them, but he can't help her. But then it was equally important for her to be like, but I'm not you. So like, I'm, you know, she knows it's coming from like a good place where he's saying, but he isn't her so she's yeah. going to make her own decisions and her own destiny whether and that's 
her decisions are good or not is up for debate. But. Kate, you have paved your way on your journey with this show. And I love that because you're like, I've never done a film before. Yeah, I've only done television. It. So yeah. coming from you, right? Nothing worth having comes easy. And you just went from apparently just TV to full-blown MCU, which is a huge, huge accomplishment. And you knocked it out of the park. So looking internally, what was your biggest takeaway like, I just did this. Like, what was your biggest takeaway on yourself, not only working on the show during a global pandemic, but tackling a TV show of the scale of the MCU? Oh, like, I think honestly, like, I think the, I guess in the first step, like banking on myself, and being pushy enough to my agent to be like, just keep calling them, keep calling them, get me in the room. And that kind of annoying, like pain in the butt attitude, I guess, to be like, and just being like, I think I just figured I'm just going to go for it because I have to just go for it and not waiting for permission, I think is something that was really I key for my yeah. career stuff. Um, but then beyond that, honestly, just having an amazing team because as a director, you're only as good as your team. And I was lucky on this that I got to hire all my heads of department and I felt like, you know, our tastes were so aligned, but also just like a good idea can come from anywhere, which I definitely also got from Marvel and also like, I love Phil Lord and Chris Miller and they're very collaborative. I know because I saw them do a talk when they were in London. And I think that's always really key for me is that the director, there's sometimes this perception, obviously you, there's an ego to it in the sense that you're directing, but you have to almost be egoless in some senses because if you like block out everyone, you're not going to make a good show because filmmaking is collaborative. It's just the nature of the art and what you're doing. So I think for me, that was really key as well, is just being really open to ideas and collaboration. And the one thing I'll say on that note, Kate, there's a difference between being annoying and being persistent. Yeah. And I would say you were <laughs> definitely persistent on that. So credit to you. Yeah, hey, at the end of the day, you got what you wanted. It all worked out. And Kate, the beautiful thing about this show is that we can look back on it and, and point out so many different moments that mm -hmm. we're just going to remember for the for MCU history. By the way, Kate, I'm still not forgiving you for that Miss Minutes scare. It still haunts my nightmares <laughs> to this day, to this day. But for you personally, what was your favorite moment of this series? Oh, okay. So there's two, there's, okay, three. I'll give you three. As, as a fan, as a fan. As a fan. As a oh, fan. I was just going to say, because on the, on the Miss Minutes jump scare, just on that, so that basically, because, you know, we used to have a big fight sequence at the start of six. And we realized, because I, I I think basically we filmed six, like when we were allowed to go back to filming and I'd already edited a lot of episode one. And we were like, oh no, actually we can be confident in sitting in these heavy dialogue scenes because the performances are amazing and, it, and it's really working tonally overall for the show. So we took out the like kind of, it was like a trial basically that He Who Remains did and they like fought through like this hall of warriors and we removed that and instead yeah, it was cool, but it's just, I think we found like, it was better to kind of build tension because like all the audience are like, who is in the Citadel? Yeah, so yeah. I felt like doing, cause we wanted to have Miss Minutes be a little bit creepy and a bit like, you know, devil on the shoulder and sinister here. And so I, and I love horror. So when they said sinister, I was like, we should do a jump scare because for me, the moment I see a jump scare as an audience member, I'm then on the edge of my seat until I see he who remains because it's so quiet and eerie and creepy. And then that really worked. I, Cause I remember in the script, I love what the writers did where the elevator opens and he's just like, oh, hey guys. And it's really yeah. casual, <laughs> relaxed. Sure. Yeah. And I just and thought, well, if I have a jump scare earlier, that's going to even more subvert what's going to happen there with the elevator doors. So that's kind of how that came to be. And um, on that note, when they yeah. were walking through the Citadel, it honestly felt like walking through a haunted house. Yeah. So yeah. the fact that you have yeah, like, yeah. that horror background and, and that passion, I really felt that as a viewer, like, okay, mm -hmm. okay. He literally almost fell out of his chair. I'm going to send you <laughs> that clip after this because it was hilarious. <laughs> like he shot back in his chair, like 10 feet rolling this way. I got to send it to you. It's so good. Um, but yeah, I mean, that reveal with the elevator, he's just chilling with an apple. So yeah, oh, that's what so they were about it. Um, and I'm sorry, and the biggest moment is a fan. Honestly, I think it's because, so Tom throughout the show, right, he's in his TVA getup. Mm -hmm. But I remember when we had to film the Gobi Desert opening, he's Avengers Loki. And I remember Tom was like taking the piss out of me because I remember I was like, it's you. Oh my God. But it was like a weird fan moment because of course. I had seen him in Avengers and like, it was sort of surreal. And I think I was like, oh my God, I'm directing Loki, like the show. This is so weird. Like, yes, and you it, are. 
yeah it was like really strange in a way because yeah but I suppose that's like the fan moment because that's the Loki that I knew from the movies that I love so that was really interesting and kind of out of the circle yeah Yeah, amazing (laughs) now Mm -hmm. unfortunately you're not going to be returning for season two of Loki which hurts us but hey I understand and respect it so moving (laughs) forward what is the next challenge for Kate Heron I think honestly, I, I want to write what I do next and I'm writing some stuff at the moment. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what I'm focused on, basically. Now, now yeah. from a genre standpoint, are we looking at TV, film? What are uh, we I have at? stuff that's both. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay you got a ton in the works. <laughs> One thing I can say though, is that I wrote a comic book for Skybound. Ooh. Um, that's coming out later that year. Cool. Like, yeah, with my writing partner. So that's one of the things I can talk about sort of vaguely, awesome. but I, that, that's what I can say. That's amazing. Yeah. We can't wait to see it come to life. And I, you know, one of the best things about this entire conversation, Kate, and I think Brad and I both both noticed this from the beginning, is that you are genuinely just a passionate fan for all of this stuff. So yeah. <laughs> when you look at the greater MCU, for you as a fan, what other characters excite you? And would you like to see their stories continue to be explored in, in different lights, the way we saw Loki's story explored in this Loki <laughs> Disney Plus series. Honestly, like, I probably would say, like, I would defer to Kevin Feige because I feel like he's my timekeeper. And so if he wanted me to, like, work on a character or do something, I would definitely go to him. One thing I spoke about online, which I still stand by, is I would love to do a Miss Minutes slasher film. I oh, think that'd be really fun. Please, <laughs> please. We don't need that. Please. <laughs> Please I, let that happen. I they're like doing, hey, They're doing a holiday special for Guardians of the Galaxy. So let's do a Miss Minutes Halloween, Halloween. special. Let's go, yeah. Kevin Feige. I think it would be great. But yeah, no, I just, I, I think the thing that I was so excited about though with the TV shows was, you know, watching the other shows as a fan and just seeing the ripple effect was just, it was so interesting to see how they connect to the movies. Because I think mm-hmm. they knew they wanted to be like big events like the film. So yeah, but anyway, but no, I'm excited to see what, and I miss so much cool stuff in the works coming from them. So I'm just excited to see where, it ha- you know, the big puzzle that Kevin Feige is building, really. But, well, yeah. hey, you were a part of that puzzle. Thank you <laughs> once again for your time, Kate. It was Thank an you. absolute pleasure meeting you and speaking with you. And once again, tremendous, tremendous work on this series. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you do next. You have a fan in us now. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, guys. All right, have a nice day. You too. Right. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.